Good morning, y'all. How are you doing? Can't see most of you because of these bright lights. Have there been a lot of sickness going through the ranks? Yeah, I'm only here because of Jesus and Mucinex and cough drops and my tea today. So thank God it wasn't the flu. Or also, I don't know who'd be up here today. But anyways, I'm just so thankful to be here. Um, Today's text is Colossians 3, verses 1 through 11. So if you all want to join me and read that while I read, uh, if you have a Bible or um, your phone, or I think it's behind me, or it will be any second now, I'm going to go ahead and read. Y'all ready? Okay, it's a little bit of text. It's 11 verses, but uh, we got this. So... Colossians 3, 1 through 11, <clears throat> and please, please have grace for me today. My throat is pretty scratchy and coffee, so, but with the Holy Spirit, we'll get through this, yeah? Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth, for you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave, or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Woo! Yes, Paul had a lot to share um, from the heart of God to the church of Colossae, didn't he? And today, as we look at God's word, I want to talk to you for a few minutes from the thought, this new life. Let's pray. Well, Father, we are so thankful to be here today. Um, We come with grateful hearts. We come open to what you want to speak to us today, Lord. Holy Spirit, just just burst forth, God, what what you want to do today. Only do what you can do, God. And we just commit this time to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So have you all been here during the series and heard Colossians 1 and 2? You all pretty much know it. Um, okay, I have been, my sermon was, I was told was really long. I have a lot of slides. So I'm just going to go over it super quickly. You know, chapter one, uh, Paul's thanking God for the, the people in Colossae. Pastor Epaphras, who has been going back and reporting to him what's been going on in the church. And Paul's writing from Rome in prison, and he's telling the people of Colossae, I'm so thankful to hear that the truth took hold in your hearts and that you're growing. <clears throat> I'm thankful for your love for God and for one another. And remember about Christ's supremacy. Because, it's, because of Christ's supremacy, we know that Christ is above all, correct? And he is the ruler and authority above everything that exists. In fact, he created everything that exists, both seen and unseen. And I don't know about y'all, but when I read that, I just want to like mic drop. I'm done. He created it all, visible and invisible. That's enough for me. So he said, don't forget that it's Christ's supremacy. And because Christ rules over all, it's by his blood alone that you are saved. He goes on to chapter two, and it's basically a warning. He's saying, listen, I'm agonizing for you because a lot of you are going back to the false teachings and the vain philosophies of mysticism, angel worship, and human um, legalism, basically. A lot of these new believers came out of those teachings, and they're now trying to walk forward in their new life in Christ, and they're creeping back in. And he's saying, look, stop. Stop going back and remember Christ alone. Nothing added is what saves you. And he's saying, hey, remember the rules of don't touch, don't taste, don't let people judge you or condemn you for what you eat, right? For what you drink, for the holy days, the new moon ceremonies, or even Sabbaths, because these rules are a shadow of the things to come, of the reality to come. And who is that reality? Christ. That's right. I was, I was studying, this, um, studying for this, and the God said, Jesus plus nothing equals absolutely everything. Isn't that great? 
It's so true. Jesus plus nothing equals absolutely everything. It is in Christ alone that we have our salvation. So here we are at the beginning of chapter three, and Paul is continuing to give the Christians at Colossae um, rules for living, ways to live. But before we do that, um, I wanna, before we break things down, I wanna tell you a little story. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks, y'all, for your patience. Speaking of rules, um, don't we as a society oftentimes, or as human beings, we kind of put people into two categories, right? The keepers of the law or the keepers of the rules and the breakers of the law or the breakers of the rules. And everybody's motivation for keeping and breaking rules is, uh, wow, what was that? <laughs> Woo, praise the Lord, <laughs> whatever that was. Um, you know, their motivations are different, but it, it, they tend to be sort of the same. So the people that are the rule keepers, the rule followers, you know, our motivation is what? We, we like to be told that we're doing a good job, right? We like to be known as people who keep the rules. And we were probably raised by our parents with good moral values and ethics. Um, and it feels good, right, to know that we keep rules. The breakers of the rules, um, maybe they weren't raised with moral ethics, um, but oftentimes we start breaking rules when there's pain and woundedness, when there's hurt, and, our, and, our, and we start to say, well, forget it. I'm not gonna follow the rules anymore. I'm just, I'm just not gonna worry about it. I'm gonna break every rule that I can. And we tend to put people in those two categories. But there's the group of people who do both. Anybody else in here who do both? I lived in that camp, okay? <laughs> As a child, you know, I was raised with good moral values and ethics. I had a great, great childhood. I just am so thankful to the Lord for the parents and the family that I had. Um, I was raised to be respectful to people, to obey. In fact, I couldn't, we couldn't say what. It had to be, yes, mom, yes, dad. We could never answer what. Um, you know, I, I was a good kid, and I, and I obeyed the rules. And so by the time I was 16, um, I, I went to high school early, finished by 16, and I was given um, some scholarship offers to play tennis at some colleges. And so, you know, a lot of people might say, wow, that's a great accomplishment. And, and it was, and it was. But I'll tell you, without Jesus, when those things go unchecked, it can be dif difficult. So I was 16. I went to UC Berkeley my freshman year. Doug and I told each other that we weren't going to tell our kids UC Berkeley existed. Um, <laughs> No offense to Berkeley, I, I love the city, but um, so I joined the tennis team at 16. I, I w lived in a co-ed dorm. Don't let your kids live in a co-ed dorm. Um, uh, one of my teammates uh, said, hey, join my sorority. It's going to be a lot of fun. So I joined a sorority, and I'll tell you, that's a lot. Playing tennis, joining a sorority, partying a lot living in a co-ed dorm, that lifestyle, it really just showed me, hey, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, and it goes unchecked. And the behavior all those years, just I kept going pleasing myself, pleasing myself and everyone else around me, and I made foolish choice after foolish choice until by the end of my freshman year, I was devastated physically, emotionally, mentally, and I didn't know it at the time, but spiritually. So my parents, being the awesome parents they were, they said, hey, take a year off, regroup, get some rest, train again hard for you know, the next season. So I took that gap year. I took that gap year. And uh, physically, mentally, and emotionally, I went to recuperate. But while I was doing all those good things on the outside, like resting and training and eating right and all the, the things that athletes do, I was still living that lifestyle behind closed doors. And by the time I was 18 and a half, I was not only in a very unhealthy relationship, but I had had two abortions by that point. And, you know, no one else knew. I was practicing and I was gearing up because I had more scholarship offers to new schools. So everything was great on the outside, right? The training, the hard work, the scholarship offers, the good achievements. But I was juggling the weight of my sin and I was hiding it from everyone else around me except for one. Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I love this, uh, I love how it says in this translation, but Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place 
while we were still lost and ungodly. Hallelujah. So one day, I uh, was coming home to start practicing. We, we had a court in the backyard, and, um, and it had canceled. The, 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 my practice partner had canceled on me, and no one else was home, and I fell to my knees. Uh, things with, with my then boyfriend had gotten worse, and I found myself in difficult predicaments, and I was on the floor of my family room just sobbing and sobbing and crying out to the only one that could help me. And God met me right where I was at, and he heard my cry. Psalm 86.5 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Amen? Doesn't he come when we call upon him? You guys, God will go to the ends of the earth to show you his love and his grace and his mercy. He will go to the ends of the earth for you because he loves you. He will pursue you because he loves you that much. He did that for me. A few days later, I went to this reunion party at a friend's house. A bunch of us had gone to the same um, junior high, and then we split off into two high schools, and then we all went our way to college. But she had this reunion party, and I met this gal, and she invited me to a Billy Graham crusade in San Jose later that week. And I went, and it was there that I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Woo! And, you know, I don't have time today, but maybe one day I'll get to share about how God dealt with me with some of that sin in, in a beaut- most beautiful way, um, so kindly and so beautifully. But like I said before, there's no place that God won't meet you. He took my sin and my shame and his immeasurable love, just all that burden of sin melted off me, and I was covered in his mercy and grace. This started my Christian walk and my new life as a believer in Jesus Christ. And this is where Paul's first words in chapter 3 challenge me. And not just me, but everyone who calls themselves a believer of Jesus in Jesus. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven and not the things of earth. Well, that's deep for a new believer or any believer if you really look at that. We're raised with Christ and we're, set, we're to set our minds on things above, what does that mean? So remember back in chapters 1 and 2 where Paul, Paul talks about the fact that all the fullness of God live within Jesus Christ, yes? And that because of his death and resurrection, it makes us complete in our union with Christ. So we're buried with Christ when we're baptized, and because we trust in the power of God that saved Jesus from the dead to new life, we're raised with him. Ephesians 2, 6 says, For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So in light of this, Paul is saying, set your minds on Christ, not in the things below. And we might tell ourselves, well, what, do we, what does that mean, Paul? Do we just keep our mind on above and not think about our life on earth anymore? Is that what that's talking about? Do we not worry about our, our lives anymore? I believe there are two ways to have a heavenly mindset versus an earthly mindset. The first has to do with our perspective, and the second is how we walk out our new life with this heavenly perspective. Excuse me. So become, before we come to faith in Christ, what are we consumed with? Ourselves, <laughs> right? Aren't we really the kings and queens of our own lives? right? And we, we spend our time thinking, how can we attain, obtain, consume? Or sometimes we reinvent ourselves to reach that goal of living the dream. And you guys, there's nothing wrong with living the dream. But like we sang earlier, God's dreams are the ones we want to live out, not our own. Because oftentimes, if it's self-driven as opposed to God-driven, we find ourselves working and running and trying to make it happen on our own. And because this perspective is based on the worldly thinking that says, gosh, if I don't have the right job, the right car, the right girlfriend, the right boyfriend, if I don't get married, if I don't make a certain amount of money by, I don't know, here, 25, I'm not a success or I'm a failure. And we base our successes and failures on a world system that has us preoccupied with our feelings, our circumstances, and frankly, worrying about what other people think, don't we? 
Let's be honest. We worry too much about what other people think of us. I spent many years people-pleasing and not being able to speak my own mind and not being able to say no. And God just got a hold of me and said, it doesn't matter. It matters what I'm telling you. It matters what I think. And it was freeing. So about 20 years ago, a lot of you may know, but 20 years ago um, in January, Doug and I pulled into Salt Lake City. We came to be a part of the church plant team that Jody and Eric were, was leading. We love them so much, and we're so thankful to have Jody continuing to lead us, don't we? And we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that we were called here. And so we started having meetings at their house and getting prepared. And about seven weeks before we were supposed to, to move here, Doug was laid off from his job. And we were like, oh, praise the Lord. That's great. Perfect timing. That gives us time to, you know, clean out more. And, and I love having him home to help me with, with preparing to move. So it was no big deal. And about a week before we were supposed to move here, Doug still didn't have a job. And we still didn't have a place to live. And so, you know, for the first two weeks of living here, we lived with our dear friends, the Kawamuras. And that was a blast. And then subsequently, we spent four months living uh, with the Van Rees. We were the Van Lees for four months. But, you know, someone may look at that situation, and I'm sure there are people that, that did, and they might say, man, Doug's taken his family to Salt Lake City. He has no job. He has no place to live. How irresponsible. What on earth are they going to do? And even more so our family. You know, we, we love them and we respected their opinions. And so that could have been a, a big deal for us. But guys, when we, when we know that the Lord has called us to something, when he's called us and we walk in obedience, that's all that matters. We were not worried. We were grateful. We prayed. We trusted that God knew what he was doing, and that in his timing, everything would work out. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, those four months that we lived with the Van Rees, it was probably one of the most profound times of our lives. You know, like I said, we continue to walk in gratitude and, and trust the Lord. And what he did between us and the Van Rees was he not only, you know, um, grew us in like-minded spirit for ministry, but most importantly, he knit our hearts in friendship. And that was, that was the most important thing that he did. And... Doug got a job. We found an apartment a few months later. And, you know, we went, on our, we went on our way. But had that not happened, God wouldn't have been able to do what he had intended to do. You understand? So we could have looked at the outside and, and people could say, what are they doing? That's just so dumb, so irresponsible. <clears throat> but we did it God's way. Perspective. Yes? Perspective. Matthew 6, 31 through 34 said, So don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. <laughs> Today's trouble is enough for today. Amen. I believe this is part of what it means to think on things above and to have a heavenly mindset. I think one of the first things that God asks us to do is to surrender control. What's that song? Jesus, take the wheel. What's her name? Carrie Underwood? I love her, right? Jesus, take the wheel. Come on. He just wants us to give it on over. Hey, guys, when we realize that God is absolutely in control of everything and that we're not, and that he has our very best in mind, and that he knows our needs before we even ask, our perspective changes. God promises to provide for us and to see us through no matter what comes our way. And he works all things together for good to those who love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. So as we grow in seeking God first, we start to care less about ourselves and more about others. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. That's not a typical earthly mindset, is it? But we, when we have that paradigm shift in our thinking, we can turn our focus from our own lives 
and look outward. For example, who is my neighbor and how can I show them the love of God? Gee, my, my, my co-worker's daughter is sick. How can I show them compassion and, and pray for them? Well, my favorite checker at Walmart says she's, she's depressed. Lord, give me some time. Open some time in her schedule so I can share the hope of Jesus with her. Or there's a family at church who's fallen on hard times. How can we meet their needs? You know, about a month ago, um, my, my car, its transmission uh, got a crack in it and just, it basically just died. And so uh, I was here at church one day and uh, thanked the Lord for my son, Noah. He was helping me out with rides. And I was in the back talking to Cynthia Wyatt and she was uh, preparing to serve the homeless down uh, with Food for the Soul. Isn't that an amazing, amazing ministry, guys? Um, and I was saying, oh yeah, I got I to gotta go. Um, I don't have a car and Noah's picking me up today. And this is such a beautiful example. She goes, well, what do you mean you don't have a car? And I told her what happened. And she said, well, we've got a car. We've got an extra car. It's sitting in the driveway. And within a couple of days, we had a car. And that's what I'm talking about. And there are other friends of mine here that offered as well. But this worked out the best just because it was a car that they weren't using. But that's the example I'm talking about. And she said, it's Jesus' car anyways, so you might as well use it. <coughs> Amen. That's the perspective I'm talking about. It doesn't belong to us. Everything we have, God gave us, and it really belongs to him first. So if we have the perspective that it's all his, then it's easier for us to share. It's e easier for us to give. It's easier for us to pour out. So I'm going to circle back around uh, to how we walk out our new life with, the, with our heavenly perspective. But let's look at Colossians 3.3. 3. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Wow, that's more deep stuff from Paul. I'm hidden with Christ, and how will I appear with him in glory? First of all, being hidden in Christ refers to the peace and the protection that God provides. You know, it may sound weird, um, but I can be honest when I fell into Jesus' arms for that first time, I knew what that meant. I felt his peace and protection immediately, and I knew that I belonged to God. There are so many wonderful scriptures in the Bible that talk about his peace and protection. Um, I've got a few here. I love scriptures, so we're going to read a couple. Uh, Zephaniah 3.17, For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty warrior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Psalm 91, 1 through 4. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust in him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers he will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Amen. Amen. And then John 10, 27 through 29. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me for my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No one can snatch them from the Father's hands. You guys, I could go on and on and on. I could read so many scriptures to you, but, I, but you have it for yourself. There's Psalm 23. There's Romans um, 8, 38 through 39. I implore you, I encourage you to get into the word of God. I know you all do already, but just get into those scriptures that, that remind you of God's love and faithfulness and peace and protection. Secondly, being hidden in Christ refers to our new identity in him. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Isn't that beautiful? We're not that same person anymore. We're new in Christ. The minute we surrender to the love, grace, and forgiveness of Jesus, we are immediately forgiven of our sins, no matter how seemingly small or big or gross, or dirty, 
or what we think is considered unforgivable. He makes us clean and new and gives us a fresh start. And in that instant, we are adopted as his sons and daughters of the Almighty God, and we become his children. Do you know that we become his children when we accept his son, Jesus? There's, there's, a, there's this thought out there in the world that says we're all God's children. You know, I'll meet someone, I don't know, just in passing, conversation always turns to the Lord, but, you know, um, oh, we're all children of God. I'm sorry to say that he created all of us in this world, but we don't become his children until we are reconciled back to him through Jesus Christ. So anyways, you know, it's, it's something cool that we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, and we are truly alive for the first time. Amen? That's what being born again means. That's what being saved by God looks like. And our eyes are open to his love, his great majesty, his forgiveness, his kindness and mercy, sometimes for the first time. In doing some study, I came across this article um, about the Hebrew word. It's hard to say when you or you have a cold. Has said. It's the Hebrew word hesed, hesed. And basically, it is, um, it's a word that we can't even translate into the English language. It's that deep, and it's that rich, and it's that descriptive. It describes God's character. But the closest thing that we can come to is loving kindness, covenant faithfulness, steadfast love, or an everlasting love beyond words. Michael Card, who is um, a, a singer-songwriter from my time, um, he, he, did, he wrote an article, he wrote a book actually, and he tried to write it about the word chesed. And the title of the book, um, he didn't know what to title it, but he, at first he said, well, I'm going to call it um, undefinable. That's what I'm going to say chesed means, because God's love is undefinable. And then he changed the name of the book to inexpressible, a mystery beyond explanation. It's this kind of love that God loves us with, beyond explanation. He finds us, he pursues us, he meets us right where we're at, and he says, come, I'm here for you. So it's in this love that we find our new identity. And here are a couple of scriptures that talk about who we are in Christ. John 1, 12, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. So we're children of God. 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. How great it is to walk in the light, yes? Romans 6, 6, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Amen. We are children of God. We're his special possession. We're a holy nation. We're a royal priesthood, and we are no longer slaves to sin. We'll talk about that a little later. <coughs> Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You see, as children of God, we have a promise of Jesus' return. Amen? Amen? And when he comes back for his, him, when, when he comes back for us, the complete and full revelation of who he is will be fully known. Fully known. And we get to share that glory with him. Philippians 3.20 says, But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. Romans 5.2, Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. So here's the flip side to getting saved, if, if there is one. When we enter into this life-transforming relationship with Christ, in a sense, we, we become strangers to the world, right? And we're not recognizable anymore. We're not the same person we were in our old life. And sometimes this causes um, friction. You guys can relate to that, anyone? And sometimes it causes rejection by the ones that love us most. Sometimes it does. 
1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And this totally happened to me right after I got saved. I had this desire to obey God and to walk in righteousness and do what God had called me to do. And the Holy Spirit was bringing conviction in my life. So all of a sudden, I was telling my then boyfriend um, that we had to stop uh, children um, doing the hoo-ha dance. You know, it was a dangerous dance. Couldn't do it anymore. And I'm telling you, it did not go over well. And all of a sudden, there was this chasm. It was an instant chasm between us in perspective and in desire and how we stood in relation to eternity. I was now a daughter of God. He was still a son of Satan. I was in the kingdom of light. He was still in the kingdom of darkness. I wanted to seek those things that were above, and his mind was still on the things of this earth. Now, let me give him some credit. He didn't reject me. He totally understood. Hey, you became a Christian? No problem. He didn't reject me right away. You know, he tried daily, relentlessly, and I might say successfully a lot of times to pull me back into my old life. Here comes Paul again, hitting me again with more words. Colossians 3, 5 through 9 says, So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and it's all its wicked deeds. Yes! <coughs> Paul was calling me out. He's saying, come on, girl. Put away your old self. Those behaviors that were controlled by your flesh for so long, it's time to put them away. It's what he's telling me in those, in those verses. That's what he's telling you guys. And you know, I wanted so badly to obey the Lord. And I did when I wasn't with him. And so I'll tell you, sometimes I could look at that, that scripture and say, well, I'm only doing the first three things in that second sentence. So I'm not doing any of the other things. But you know, you don't think that someone that's walking in the new life, like myself, clashing with someone walking in the old life, didn't produce those other things, like anger, rage, malicious behavior, and dirty language. I was struggling with all of it. So while I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was saved, forgiven, and a new creation on the inside, I wish I could say that my flesh was in submission and that I quickly walked in that way. You guys, it would have saved me so much pain, heartbreak, and brokenness. And I'm going to just speak for a minute to the young people out here who I can't really see, but I know you're out there. Take it from someone who's been there. If you have found yourself in a relationship with a non-believer, I don't care how good looking he is or beautiful she is. I don't care how nice and how attentive. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And it's not that God can't do such great things, but he's, he's asking you to walk in the ways he's called you to first. You know, the, the Bible says, what relationship does, does darkness have to do with light? Save yourself pain, save yourself heartbreak, save yourself the brokenness that you're gonna find in trying to walk with a non-believer in a relationship, amen? Take it from someone who's been there. There's a lot of healing that God has to do when you find yourself out of that relationship. And let me just encourage those who are in a relationship with a non-believer. God is big. He's able to do that. He's able to bring your spouse to the Lord. You know, have faith and trust. Walk with him. Pray for your spouse and you'll see. You'll see miracles from the Lord. But for those who aren't married yet, I beseech you. That means I urgently plead with you. 
to listen to God. He has something great for you when you walk in obedience. So while salvation offers forgiveness and guarantees eternal life with Christ, it doesn't guarantee a life perfectly lived, yes? So there I was walking forward in my new life, but I found myself floundering and failing more often than not. Paul addresses this very real struggle in Romans 7. Verses 18 and 19, he says, And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Verses 24 and 25, Oh, what a miserable person I am. That's how I felt half the time, because I was struggling and falling, walking forward and falling, going to Bible study and falling. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. See? So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Can anyone in the room relate to that? And that can be really defeating, but we go back and look what Paul says. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ. You guys, God is so good that he doesn't come to our rescue and then leave us to our own devices. He doesn't do that. When Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, where we positionally stand right now, right? We're already there at the right hand of the Father positionally. He left us the Holy Spirit who came to live in us and to dwell in us. And that's, that's the answer right there. Romans 8, 1 through 2 says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Hallelujah. That's it right there. I love it. The power of the Holy Spirit, God himself living in us, that we can strip off our old nature, how we can put in our new nature and walk in victory and freedom. God's already forgiven us our sin, you guys. We have a clean slate. We're perfect and holy in his eyes already. But we must choose to walk daily by the power of the Holy Spirit and in his strength, not our own. So how do we attain that? First of all, let's remember who we are and our position as believers. We're children of God, raised to new life with Christ, seated with him in heaven. We're chosen people, a royal priesthood, God's special possession. We're no longer slaves to sin. We are called to set our minds on things above and not on the earth. And we look forward to Jesus' return when we'll share in his glory. Good stuff. Good stuff to remember. Good stuff to strengthen us daily. But we have an enemy of our soul, don't we? And all he knows how to do is lie. That's his native tongue, is lie. He is going to constantly lie to us and tell him that we are not who God says we are. And the world is going to constantly try to pull you back into its thinking, its ways, its culture, the lure of the false sense of freedom that tells us we can do what we want. It doesn't matter. We can be who we want. We can recreate ourselves. We can identify with whatever we want to. That's what the world tells us now. And we can, we can just do what, what matters, whether, whether it's whether it's unnatural, whether it's against what God had originally created us for. The world tells us it's okay to be that because God doesn't really matter or he doesn't really love us. On and on and on, all those lies perpetuate us on a daily basis and we need to stand strong in his word. But again, God doesn't save us and then not give us the instructions and tools with which to live, amen? Second Corinthians 10, three through five it says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Woo, yes. All that thinking that permeates our culture today that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We have the divine weapons with which to fight those. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against principalities, rulers of the air. 
Ephesians 6, 12 through 18, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from good news, so you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery sword or fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is our Christian life following Jesus, but it's a walk that takes faith, obedience, courage, trust, staying grateful, and keeping our eyes on God in the midst of everything, good times and bad. Paul goes on to encourage us in verse 10. How's my time? Okay. Colossians 3.10 says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. First John tells us that we've overcome the world by our faith, right? But again, it's a daily walk that we choose to follow God in. Keep our eyes set on the things above. Bless you, bless you. <coughs> and we need to renew our minds daily if we're going to walk in that way, in the freedom that he's called us to. Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I love saying good and acceptable and perfect. I, I memorized that in college, gap. There you go. Good, acceptable, perfect. Easy way to remember. <laughs> says, um, stop imitating the ideals and opinions. This is another translation, so hear it again in this translation. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Isn't that cool? The way it puts that. You guys, this new life requires renewed thinking. He has so many good things in store for each and every one of us. He has plans. He has dreams. He has goals for us. He has things for us to accomplish. He has people for us to love into the kingdom of light. Amen? I'm encouraged um, by what Paul says about our thought life. Finally, uh, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Isn't that a great way to keep our mind on things above? I know that's so convicting for me when I start to go to my basement behavior, which is more often than I'd like to admit. But when I read this scripture, it just reminds me to think upon those things. Paul ends this part of his letter to the Colossians with this revolutionary statement. Colossians 3.11 Sorry, guys. <clears throat> In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Another translation. Listen to this. In this new creation life, your nationality makes no difference, or your ethnicity, education, or economic status, they matter nothing. For it is Christ that means everything as he lives in every one of us. You guys, the world separates us into categories, doesn't it? The haves, the have-nots, the racially privileged, the racially underprivileged, the smart and the mentally challenged, the normal and the disabled, the keepers of the law and the breakers of the law. The world wants to keep us separated in those categories. But Galatians 3 says it this way, you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Who doesn't love new clothes? There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And as we close, we're gonna take communion, but as we close, 
I just want to remind you of this. That we're all the same. And this includes the very least of these who are not in our purview. The elderly, forgotten in rest homes. The poverty stricken on the other side of the city. The prostitutes walking on streets that we don't drive down. The men and women who fill our prisons. The young people who are sex trafficked that we will never see. Jesus levels the playing field for all of us. There is no difference. And he comes to them. He finds them and he saves them with his love as well. And that makes us all the same. Amen? So as we go forward today, I just, I just encourage you guys with all that I have, that as we walk in this new life, to love each other the way Christ has loved us. Amen. So I'm going to, um, thanks you guys for listening. Um, we're going to have you guys come up. Thank you very much. We're going to do communion. Thanks to the adventure team for getting that started. Hey, Jim. Thank you. Hope y'all were a little encouraged today. And uh, as they pass out the elements, I just want to um, encourage you. Well, while they're doing that, how, how long do we have? About three or four minutes? Okay. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the end of part of that story for me. I went on a uh, missions trip to YWAM and, uh, after my junior year in college. And uh, in Hong Kong, we were all together. And one night, I just felt this urgency to go up to the top of the roof. It was, I don't know, a 20-story building. And it was pitch black that night, and there was a full moon out. And I had my Bible. And that was a moment in my life that I was just pouring over Psalm 139, verses 23, 24, I think. And it says, search me, O God, and know my anxieties. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me to the way everlasting. Basically, search my heart. Show me. Show me. I paraphrased that, by the way. I think I missed a word or two in there. But I was just saying, search me, God. Show me. Show me my heart. And if there's, you know, show me my anxieties. And I'm, I'm out there just crying before the Lord. And in the silence of that night, he whispered to me, you took the life of your babies. You took those babies' lives. But within a few seconds, he said, but I love you and I've forgiven you and you are whole and made new. All at once, you guys, I understood the wrath of God and what I deserved, but also his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness all at once. And it changed my life forever. Because within I don't know how long it was. I was just laying there on the roof <coughs> under the full moon with these beautiful mountains. But I, I just had my face on the ground. And he basically recounted to me that particular sin that I hadn't dealt with. I had swept it under the rug for many years. But he's like, you know what? You can't move forward in your walk with me. You, if, you wanna, if you want to be all you can be, you can't keep that and not, not deal with it. And so he was kind enough and loving enough to deal with me that particular moment when he knew that I was ready. And he just said, yeah, you took the lives of your baby. You chose that. But my love and grace and forgiveness is for you and you're covered. Amen. Isn't that awesome? It's a beautiful thing that God did for me that day. <clears throat>